Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sitakshi, and on behalf of India FinTech Forum, I welcome you all to the online session on unmasking financial scams, safeguarding trust in the digital era. This webinar is supported by Feeds AI. So before we start the session, here are a few points for our online attendees. So attendees may enter their name and then post their questions on the webinar screen in the Ask a Question panel. Uh, the questions will be taken towards the end of the session, and the webinar will also be recorded and published on India FinTech Forum's YouTube channel. Okay, so in today's interconnected world, where technology pretty much shapes our life, financial scams and frauds have unfortunately become more prevalent than ever. The digital, the digital era has brought tremendous convenience, but it has also exposed individuals and organizations to significant risks. Today, we have gathered here to shed light on this crucial issue and explore ways to safeguard trust in this digital landscape. With that, it is my pleasure to invite the speakers for today's session. Very experienced uh, speakers, as you will see. So a very warm welcome to Mr. Daniel Holmes, um, the Fraud Prevention SME at Feeds AI. We have Mr. Mahesh Rajraman, Rajaraman. Head of RICU, which is Retail SME Agri Cards Liability, and Head of AML Risk Management at Yes Bank. And we have Mr. Vikram Babbar, Partner and Leader, Broad Management, specifically Forensic and Integrity, Financial Services at EI, as well as Fin Crime Compliance, Compliance Lead, AML COE, as well as the Chairperson ACFCS India Chapter. Mr. Vikram Babbar will also be moderating the session. And with that, um, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Daniel Holmes to give the keynote speech. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me just share a few slides here. So what I wanted to do to set the scene, um, rather than this, I think, turning into a keynote, I think I wanted to position uh, the context ahead of the conversation and the panel discussion that we will, we will get into. Um, first, let me just take a moment to introduce FeedsEye. Um, so FeedsEye are a fraud and financial crime prevention company. Uh, we've been around on the market since 2011. We were actually founded in Portugal, which is where our HQ remains. But as you can see from some of the logos that you see on screen, uh, we now work with um, a number of different institutions, primarily banks all around the world, helping to keep their customers safe from, from fraud and scams. Um, we have a variety of, of different product capabilities and um, an underlying technology that enables those products, which today isn't the time to, to get into those things. Obviously, more information is available upon, upon request. But I really want to just give everybody visibility of, of who feeds I are. Uh, and I'm sure as we move through this conversation, you'll start to understand some of the, some of the real key challenges that we're starting to unpick and, and unpack for some of the banks that we, that we work with globally. So ahead of getting into the, the conversation, I really wanted to, to set the scene. Um, in terms of changing expectations for banks, customers, um, and regulators worldwide. So the fraud landscape, as you heard in the introduction, is very much fast changing. Um, as things like real-time payments become more the norm, they create convenience for customers, but they also create opportunities for fraudster and, and criminals. Um, and what we're seeing criminals do more and more is recognize that um, as these new rails come online, they create opportunities for monetization. And they're recognizing that um, through the right attack vectors and through the right attack methods, there are opportunities for them to monetize more frequently than ever before. Um, therefore, we think about three key strategic pillars from a prevention perspective. So number one is thinking about how we can put the customer at the heart of the fraud decisions that we make. Um, thinking about customers as a user ID or a PAN number uh, and thinking about them as different channels is no longer enough to protect the multi-vector attacks that the criminals and fraudsters are initiating. We recognize that the customer must be at the heart of the risk decision in order to drive the best defensive capabilities for the, for the bank and give yourselves the best opportunities to keep the customer safe. Now, as um, fraud evolves and as the type of attack evolves, inevitably regulation will follow. However, of course, regulation is always behind the moving attack types and therefore it's often trying to keep up rather than get ahead of the fraud. But we also recognize that regulation is a, is a key pivot point for banks and that it changes what they have to think about from a strategic outlook. And it also drives significant investment case and opportunity within the bank as well. So I'm sure we'll touch on today, particularly from a scam perspective, 
what regulation really means from a, a liability and who really owns that cost of a, of a fraud and scam. Is it the bank? Is it the customer? Are there other parties such as social media and telcos that should start to bear some of the burden for these for these fraud typologies? And I think the final point that I would that I would make on this slide, if we look over to the right hand side, is that customers are starting to recognize that they have options. Um, fraud is a often a huge pivot point and a fork in the road when it comes to the trust that that bank has with that customer and where that customer may decide to do their banking relationship in future. Customers recognize that fraud is a cost of doing business. And the reality is if we look at the stats and then we look at the numbers, um, fraud can happen to anyone and does happen to anyone. We've seen this happen to run of the mill consumers. We've seen it happen to highly academic individuals. We've seen it happen to famous people and, and celebrities. Um, so this really can happen to anybody, but I think it's how it's dealt with, not only from a detection perspective, but also from a reimbursement and a treatment and a process perspective that really it creates that pivot point in terms of do you strengthen relationship with your customer as a result of the fraud or do you miss that opportunity and potentially lose their trust? Um, and as the saying goes, trust takes a lifetime to build, but it can be gone in just a moment and that moment could indeed be, be the fraud. Um, so I'm sure we'll dive into that in much more detail as we get into the to the conversation. Um, scams and, and social engineering is very much going to be the, the focus for today's discussion um, amongst the panel. We also recognise that there are a whole bunch of other fraud typologies out there. I think we're on a we're on a journey. Fraud is cyclic by design, in that fraud happens. You put in a set of defences. Of course, that doesn't deter the criminals from wanting to attack you and trying to monetize, they simply just change what they're doing and think about how can I overcome and circumnavigate those controls that have put in place. And that actually is my hypothesis around why we've landed in this, this era of scams now. And I'll unpack that a little bit more as we get into some of the some of the detailed dialogue. But I think being multifaceted with your approach to scam and fraud prevention is going to be critical so that you're not constantly playing whack-a-mole and thinking about how can I eliminate this fraud type? How can I eliminate this one? How do I create a holistic strategy that enables me to set up for success, regardless of the fraud typology that is that is hitting me? Um, and the final slide that I would leave you with um, is that we very much now start to think about this as no longer just thinking about transactions, no longer thinking about just devices, no longer thinking about just location, no longer just thinking about behavioral biometrics. How do we think about these things as a, as a collective? So your customer no longer cares about whether they're interacting with the card through a mobile device through a web device, they expect the same consistent treatment and the same consistent protection across all of these channels. And it's really underpinning with this kind of solution where you're thinking about transactions and session context together, that's gonna to give you the best opportunity to do that. And we call it prevention and detection of fraud. Traditionally, we think about the detection of fraud at the point of material risk, a transaction occurs, how do you make that real-time decision and decide whether that transaction should leave? But actually, when you combine these two things, you give yourself the opportunity to bring that detection further back into the journey and think about it as a prevention. So how do I think about having the most vast amount of context so that when somebody logs in to an online banking portfolio, I can detect the risk there and protect the customer as an asset, protect their data, protect their integrity, rather than waiting for that moment of traditional material risk, which is the point of transaction. So these will just be three or four of the um, the things that will underpin the conversation. But I just wanted to take those five minutes at the start just to give a, a very quick high level uh, set of context and of course introduce Feed's Eye to the, to the audience. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I will stop and I believe I will hand to uh, Vikram who will take control of the conversation. Sure, thanks. Thanks Daniel so much. And uh, firstly, welcome to all uh, the participants who joined us today. Uh, Good evening uh, if you're in India and, you know, good afternoon, good morning if you're uh, not part of India, but some other region uh, across the globe. Uh, I would like to thank the India Fintech Forum for uh, inviting me today to be uh, part of this session. A very interesting session, uh, which we're going to talk about. And uh, I'm joined by Daniel and Mahesh, uh, you know, my, my good uh, colleagues with me here. Uh, and we're going to talk about unmasking financial scams. And I think... Uh, why I say it's interesting is because we are actually living in a very, you know, in an environment today that has completely changed post COVID. I think the way we've been interacting today as consumers, as practitioners, as professionals, there's a lot of digital in our own lives, right? The way we are really moving. And that's truly, it's called the digital era. Uh, but if, if I also look at the way the fraud landscape or the scam landscape has changed over the last few years, that also has undergone a significant uh, change in terms of 
how we are really looking at uh, you know the frauds really hitting us in 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 a, in a big way what i thought is given that this topic is something that has been you know we've been discussing about fraud we've been discussing scams uh, you know be hearing about these since a long time i thought maybe it's important to dissect this into multiple themes so what we'll do today is uh, you know dissect this this whole topic into four key themes and maybe what i'll do is go one by one and dan and mahesh uh, you know we'll we'll discuss those four themes and then you know deliberate on that and you know we'll we'll be happy to take any questions uh, the audience would have uh, maybe during the course of our discussion or maybe towards the end uh, but that's how we should move forward i hope that's fine with you as well so uh, coming back to you know let me let me pick up the first theme you know if we are talking about scams i think india has is not been a country that has been spared uh, in fact we've been facing a lot of such issues we've been reading a lot of headlines when it talk, comes to fraud and scams uh we were talking about uh, bigger scams earlier these are like the large lending wholesale bank scams that uh, you know we've all known about the king fishers the nirav modis of the world and india has really faced those big problems uh today when we look at the challenges they are a bit different in the sense that while we have the lending problems on one side we are now looking at the digital channels being picking up big time and we are looking at upi as a key product for us Uh, but we also hearing about you know dan in your presentation you mentioned about social engineering scams you are looking at some whatsapp related payment scams right now that is currently going around so there are there are you know these are the things that are really impacting consumers at large when we used to look at the wholesale banking frauds those were one customer impacting multiple banks today when we took, talk about the digital uh, side of things impacting multiple consumers at large so i think that is how we see there's a change in the way the profile of scams has happened so mahesh maybe i'll come to you first what is your view on this changing landscape i know that you know we have we are reeling under the lending issue still you know i'm not saying that's gone but what's your view on the changing landscape today when we look at you know i was reading the rbi report of fi 23 as well and uh, if i look at the count and the value uh, the volume uh, close to 50% of the volumes are now related to digital frauds uh so what do you think uh, in your view is there a change in the landscape of frauds in our country in the last few years and as a banker what are your top concerns when you when you really look at these kind of statistics i think it's a very important point which you raised vikram uh, if you see the indian landscape as it is we had we have moved significantly forward on the digital landscape and we're talking about we are in the cusp of digital transformation so to say to the extent that uh, payments are being used in every to a, to a tea shop or guy to a grocery shop it is all through google pays and and zupa which is the imps platform which has been uh, uh, which has been accepted as a great success globally and we have now gone to the extent of having interoperability within countries as well so i think that's a great uh, digital transformation and if you see the landscape fraud landscape how is it changed earlier those days we used to have this lost stolen frauds and card not present frauds and skimming frauds those are the things which have been an identity frauds you know those are the things which used to be talk uh, spoken earlier so then controls came in in terms of second factor authentication for card not present transaction chip uh, chip has come as a mechanism for con- to address the skimming frauds and Uh, for lost and stolen, you have that card and pin uh, as a solution which has come across. So those things are out of window literally. Now we are going into a new set of scams, and as you rightly pointed out, and as rightly Daniel pointed out, when you go through us more digital, and typically the way uh, these frauds emerge, I think uh, not to say anything about a particular country, it emanates from UK, and the identity theft emanated from UK, and then it came to other countries. So when you talk about fraud, you take those learnings from the different countries and say, okay, it's come there, so it's going to come to us. so i think that's the uh, learning which we have and in that sense if you see that clearly we have this uh, the point which daniel and you clearly mentioned social reengineering engineering frauds phishing smishing wishing and even uh, to the extent of job scams people get so tuned to this job job scams the other day i was in a meeting with a regulator and uh, this is one item which is coming as a big and the customer knows that is 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 been targeted and is is genuinely offering this as a money to him and then when he realizes the job is not coming to him he is disputing a transaction so how do we deal which the, with those kind of uh, things and off late because of this digital transactions happening in a heavy way number of mule accounts which are used and the accounts are for that matter even rented so you are 
able to rent an account for 1000 rupees 2000 rupees uh, inr in india and then flow through money up and down and money coming in money going out on the same day and when you actually get into these uh, situation it points out to some kind of cyber issues as well and it, it is sometimes even cross border so even the ministry of home affairs is extremely concerned about the fact that so many mule accounts are getting open for this purpose and money is getting out and in out of the country so i think that's if you ask uh, the major problem which is being faced in india is this issue of uh, mule accounts and when you come to the lending side opening of fake websites look alike of company websites and then taking loans and then vanishing off opening up and opening up fake corporate salary accounts then using that money for lending purposes and then going out vanishing in terms of credit runaways so i think these are the major problems and summary in summary if you want to say it will be more of mule accounts than the social engineering and all those things and finally to the credit runaways actually so i think this is a broad uh, spectrum of the fraud which is happening and as you rightly find that is it is it is a natural outcome of the digital transformation so sure. uh, something which is good to happening from a customer perspective we have its own fallacies which is there and we need we as bankers have to and industry has come together to handle that i think that's a limited point which i want to say uh, absolutely you know mayesh completely agree i think you are absolutely right uh, we are clearly into the digital transformation mode i think as a country as a financial services sector but yeah, at the same time we are witnessing some bit of innovation in even when it comes to fraud right you know and and, and customers are they are quite gullible uh, the vulnerabilities are quite high in the market today and uh, you know and, and therefore it's much easier and like you said the complexities around cross border uh, movement of payments the way we are, we are penetrating from a payments perspective and then how it's moving cross border so quickly so swiftly uh, is also adding to the complexity so thanks for uh mentioning that uh dan i'll just come to you know in this theme i'll just come to that because mahesh also touched upon saying that sometimes it could be uk it could be any other country but <laughs> but, uh, but from that perspective dan uh you know given your profile it's not you know it's uh, while we're talking about india as a country right now it's not pertinent only to india i'm sure you know this is a problem global which is much more global we are seeing payments penetration across the globe i you know i work in at least 10 10 countries out of india and i'm seeing this kind of challenge but what's your view what's what's your view on this uh, on the global landscape when it comes to payments and penetration on fraud as such yeah so i, I actually agree with with mahesh in the sense that um the uk has actually been experiencing this scam problem now for um four or five years at, at large um you know we we've, we've got some numbers to 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 share you know we're in this position in the in the uk where all the banks are happy to club their fraud data together in an anonymized way and push it out into the public domain and that helps uh government banks consumers recognize the size and scale of the of the problem um so in in 2022 we saw um around about half a billion uh uk pounds was lost to to scams and that includes all the scam types that mahesh mentioned sometimes it's an investment scam sometimes it's a purchase scam sometimes it's a job scam sometimes it's a romance scam so even that term scam is a an umbrella term for all these subtypologies that that we will see and i do just want to level set in the sense that when we say scam what we mean is that it's the customer themselves making an authorized transaction um so it's the legitimate user going onto their legitimate device and then making that payment because they've been told to do so by a by a third party or by a by a scammer um and actually i think mahesh's assessment of how we got here was was really interesting in the sense that he spoke about some of those traditional fraud types skimming card not present account takeover phishing um you know you mentioned the fact that additional authentication steps have been put into the journey and that's allowed us to uh, let's say get good control over those fraud typologies um i would also add to those authentication controls that there's been some significant um technological advancements as well in the sense that a lot of banks have started to think about using device identifiers and location analytics and behavioral concepts so that when a transaction takes place yes core transaction monitoring has been at the heart of many banks fraud strategies for a number of years and we're looking for anomalous transactions does it fit with the normal pattern of the individual and so on but if you lay that together with the sense of well this is a different device to what this customer normally uses and they're in a different country or a different city to where they normally log in from it actually allows you to get a really good sense of control when you're looking at answering the question is it the genuine customer making the the transaction and i think what the fraud has realized is it's not the bank's authentication process or the bank's control ecosystem that's the weakest part of the chain anymore the weakest part of the chain now is the customer themselves so they target the customer whether it be through the job scam whether it be through the investment scam all these things that we just discussed 
And we're actually in quite a concerning position where now sometimes the victim or the consumer trusts the scammer more often than they trust their bank. And that's a very difficult cultural um, paradigm for us to try and unpack because we even see scenarios now where the fraudster will convince the customer to do something. And then when um, the customer tries to make the transaction and they speak to the bank, the bank will warn them that there's a risk of scam, but the customer will insist that they want to go ahead because the fraudster has done such a good job at, at building that trust with them in the in the first place. Um, and we started to see this, going back to your question, Rickham, um, exploding all over the world. So we had the numbers there from the UK. Um, in the US, scams are costing consumers around $10 billion every year. Um, in Australia, um, so in the, in the APAC region, uh, we've seen about $3 billion um, Australian dollars every year being lost to scams. And of course, this is forcing regulators to set up and, and take action because in most part of the world, um, it's actually the, um, the victim that bears the cost of the scam rather than the bank. Whereas that's, of course, the opposite in most scenarios when it's a, an unauthorized fraud, it tends to be the bank that will process that refund and, and where the loss. Um, so I think these are all the things that are in play, but it's very much a, a global issue. Um, of course, we've, we've started to see um, in, in, in my position and, and my team that Different banks are at different stages of maturity from a, a scam prevention technology perspective, a scams process, a scams authentication, a scams regulation perspective. Um, so we're starting to build up a view of what's worked and, and what hasn't worked. But, you know, I would leave it with, with this. And, you know, what Mahesh said at the start was um, these things tend to come out of the UK. And I think the eyes of the world are also on the UK when it comes to looking at how the UK respond. So, again, skipping out the things that haven't worked well and doubling down on the things that have allowed the UK to start to control some of these. And that half a billion figure that I quoted for 2022 was actually 20% less than what we saw in 2021. So it shows that if you can control this and can put the right practices and process in place, you can make an impact and you can start to get back ahead of the curve when it comes to protecting consumers. Yeah. Well, absolutely, Dan. I think thanks for uh, sharing those uh, statistics with us and also insights. And clearly, this is a global issue, like you rightly said. Uh, you know, the kind of fraud losses that we are hearing about, uh, which countries are facing, is exorbitant from that perspective. And I think uh, if you really look at that, it, it it won't be an overstatement if I say that these scams are now becoming a global pandemic in itself. Uh, you know, which is because they're impacting customers, individuals, institutions, all at the same time. So I think this itself, you know, can be looked into from that perspective. But that's that's part of what we wanted to discuss as part of our first theme in, in, in terms of how really, you know, big this problem is, how really the profiles have changed and how innovative they, they are really becoming, you know, as we as we move on uh, in, in from an industry standpoint. Uh, if I if I really, uh, you know, get into our second theme for today uh, in terms of our dissection of the topic, uh, clearly, you know, when we're hearing about the problem, it's about then understanding the impact. Of, of these uh, issues or these scams or these frauds. Uh, you know, we, we, we obviously understand the impact is multifold. It's not just about the fraud losses, like you rightly said, Dan uh, and Mahesh. Uh, so clearly it's a financial impact, but at the same time, it's an impact from a regulatory perspective. It's an impact from a perspective of, uh, 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 you know, customer confidence in the organization. So there are multifaceted impact of, of, of this. So uh, let me, Mahesh, let me come back to you on this again. Uh, if I summarize the way the impact of these issues are, it's, it's more about reputation, right? It's more about reputational damage an organization faces. Uh, how would you look at the reputational impact from a perspective of customer or a consumer or your, your bank customers and also from a perspective of the regulatory uh, aspects? Because today when an organization, you know, in India, you know, we have a lot of reporting requirements when it comes to fraud. Uh, there are multiple countries across the globe that have reporting requirements, but there are many countries, uh, especially in the emerging markets, that, that that still don't have a reporting regime when it comes to fraud incidents. Uh, from a perspective of India, how would you look at these kind of issues or these kind of frauds uh, from a regulatory impact perspective or a regulatory reputation perspective? Because regulator today will look at, it, at you as a bank very differently if you're reporting many, many frauds from this perspective as compared to a bank where the frauds are much lesser. So what is your view on that uh, from that perspective? And also another point I want to add there, Mahesh, is are these frauds all related to how banks are looking at their controls or there is a problem in the controls or is it also about uh, 
the awareness issues at, from a customer standpoint. Uh, I'm coming to that point because, you know, if, if I take the cue of what Dan mentioned, uh, it, it's about customers believing the scammers more than what the bank would want to say. And, and that's the point, Dan, you mentioned uh, just some time back. Uh, is, is it because that the scamsters have a lot of information and data and they are able to profile the customer very well? They're able to understand the vulnerability and therefore they're doing that. So there is an impact on customer awareness for sure. But is it also to do with bank uh, bank controls at the same time? So Mahesh, maybe two, three things together, but uh, you know, just wanted to get your views on uh, the, the overall impact from a reputation perspective, from a regulatory perspective, and where do you think the issue is? Uh, is it at the bank level or is it at a customer awareness level? What's your view? I think uh, Vikram, you nicely summed it up. This uh, so initially we started with what are the challenges. Now we kind of come coming across to say what are the regulatory implications of this and customer implications. So at a broader level, if you see, as we rightly see that the regulatory is very concerned about this customer getting impacted. At one side, yeah, the customer is gullible, and uh, when you look at these huge amount of monies coming into mule accounts. The transfer is happening with the knowledge of the customer because no transaction is happening without a password which is there. There's always a PIN and a password which, which, which only the transactions are happening. So technically, as uh, Daniel and you had mentioned earlier, it is more of a customer getting gullible. But the regulator doesn't view that way. Regulator is keenly asking you saying, okay, fine, the customer is gullible, but what is the kind of an education message which you have given to the customer, number one. Number two, how do you control these uh, kind of uh, monies coming into the mule accounts? What kind of controls do you have in terms of opening up your accounts? KYC today is not in the paper. It's know your customer is not in the paper. It is know your customer in the spirit of the circular actually. So if you see that customer is X, then do you know that this guy is, is of this profile? Suppose he's a profile, suppose you take a simple uh, sole proprietorship of account in India. Suppose he's declared a turner of say five crores. Is he actually worth that five crores in terms of transaction is something the regulator is expecting the bank to check at the account opening level. Forget about the gullible customer, uh, customers getting gullied and transferring money into these mule accounts. So I think the fundamental problem is about the targeted customer education is becoming a big point here. Now we have seen targeted marketing communications and uh, now it's time for targeted uh, risk and fraud communication to the customers segment wise. So senior citizen should have a different method of operation because he is not looking into his SMSs. So probably an outbound call to him, an automated outbound call to him will really help. The youngsters probably an SMS or a WhatsApp banking should really help. And the, third, and the segment which is in the mid level should be educated in a different way. So I think uh, the ma whole market has to move from targeted uh, sales uh, or marketing communication to targeted risk communication, which will kind of address this issue in a very holistic way and more importantly the other thing is from an industry perspective yes you're right Vikram the bank which reports a higher fraud are being pulled up by RBA to understand what controls they have so so as I, as I said earlier while the customer is gullible the question immediately which is been asked is okay fine but what kind of monitoring you have uh, do you have a 24 bar 7 365 3 real time monitoring which is available in sync with your customer base have you called up the customer on the on the first okay let's the first transaction go through but why did you all over run on this kind so that's a question which is getting asked so and typically what's happening is a fraud in one bank is becoming an aml problem of the other bank the customer is dis uh, disputed a i mean he has done a transaction and he's disputing a transaction but that money is flowing into another bank which is a mule account and, and money is coming in huge amounts is a typically an uh, anti-money laundering issue found. And, and, and we really know that these monies are going into some unlawful activities. So I think that's a fundamental point which is also getting discussed. The more important point is today at the retail lending level, we have a consortium model which has been driven by one of the bureaus by having an Experian Hunter solution which captures all the suspected fraudulent uh, accounts. But the other important point is how do we ensure that uh, we have a similar kind of a bureau, which is for handling all these new accounts, which is coming in? Do we have a system to report these new accounts? So those are the things which I think we need to work as an next stage, which you also says is a suggestion to the regulators, actually. So those are the points which we need to look at it uh, at, the, at a broader level. And some of these frauds and some of these uh, mule accounts and some of these uh, 
uh, issue which is coming across even attracts uh, the attentions of the parliament uh, parliament and then these issues are discussed at the lok sabha and rajya sabha as well so it's a it's a it's a problem in that sense but fundamentally if you ask me what is the solution it is about targeted communication segmented level marketing communication like uh, risk communication and the second point is the <coughs> the consortium of data which can really help to solve this problem where accounts are getting opened or where transactions are happening we do have something called cpfir or C, uh, which 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 we report all the disputed transactions to the regulator and that is getting shared across the banks so industry collaboration is there in that way but overall how do we need to work is something we need to uh, there, there is always a scope of improvement in this area that's the point which i want to say vikram no thanks so much mahesh i think a very very relevant input uh, uh, you know that you gave is about how you can target the educational session around you know consumers because the consumers behavior is very different uh, given the different uh, profile age profile uh, you know the the way the customers come from different segments so how can you really target the way you want to educate the customer when it comes to fraud awareness and i think how importantly that is being done by organizations today and that's something that uh, it clearly is a focus area and something that can be really made much better so thanks for sharing that input i think that's really really uh, useful as such and obviously like you rightly said i think it's about how you also safeguard your reputation when it comes to regulatory action because today when there are number of cases that are coming up like i said uh you know more than 50% of the cases are now in the digital uh, side so clearly rbi is going to ask questions it you know the way we seeing our regulators you know the activities or the actions that are coming in there it there would be a question back to the bank on how are you really looking at uh you know monitoring that and we'll come to that in the subsequent theme but thanks uh, mahesh for that uh, as such but you know uh, mahesh just did touch upon an important point again and uh, maybe dan i should ask you about that and you also mentioned in your introduction that if from a regulatory standpoint if there is a fraud and in fact uh, i would also try to link one of the audience questions to this uh, if there is a fraud and you know customer is coming back to the bank and saying i have a problem i have a fraud whose liability is it is really uh, you know uh, at that point of time is it the bank's liability and if it is because the regulator has clearly in india it's a clear regulation that if the customer comes back with a complaint uh, within 3 days i think there is a timeline that has been given the transaction has to get reversed by the bank and then later on it can get investigated and subsequent course of action can be taken and i'm sure there are multiple other regions or countries that have followed suit when it comes to uh, uh, this activity but in real sense whose liability should re- it really be is it the bank's liability all the time uh, is it the customer's liability it should be a joint liability or is it any third party it should be multiple banks that are involved in the payment transaction what's what's your take on that uh, dan from from a perspective and there is a question from our audience as well that why should a banking transaction can not get reversed if if there is a, a fraud complaint from a customer as such yeah so actually all, all of the above that you mentioned become are all true in various parts of the world so i think you know the first thing i would say is that different regions have different strategies from a regulatory perspective and a reimbursement perspective in terms of who owns the cost of of that fraud how i would think about this to try and simplify it for the, for the audience and to try and generalize at a global level is that we think about fraud in the two ways we've been talking about it so far so you've got the unauthorized transactions where it's the fraudster making the transaction within the customer's accounts broadly speaking um customers will get refunded 100% of the time if that fraud happens where we have the ambiguity and the major differences is on the authorized side so where the scam is um processed by the by the consumer or by the victim that's where we have um differing approaches so i would say generally as a as a um uh, let's say at a global level it's the customer that's owning that loss okay so the customer will end up out of pocket however the trend is very much moving towards pushing that liability back towards the bank so that it aligns with the unauthorized strategy that the bank have had in place for many years so let me give you a, a couple of examples of that in the in the uk we introduced something called the contingent reimbursement model um about 4 years ago and what that said was unless the bank can prove that the customer has been grossly negligent during a scam the bank will have to refund them um okay so that leaves a, a hanging question of how do you define grossly negligent and that's ambiguous and that's very hard to do and i'm certainly not going to try and solve it on on this call 
Uh, but it is a key thing that, that global regulators will, will need to think about. And that's got us to a position where we're refunding somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of, of authorized transactions. Now, if you think back to the start, I said the actual loss number was nearly half a billion. So that's still 200, 250 million that consumers are, are out of pocket. Um, what we're seeing now is a, an attempt to move it towards a 100 percent of refunds, 100 percent of the time situation. So giving consumers more protection when they're a victim of a, of a scam. And there are actually some risks of unintended consequences from that as well. You know, does it create an opportunity for first party and collusion? Does it create a risk of um, underbanking and that banks want on board a customer if there's a risk that they might be scammed in future? So these are all of the things that we could perhaps talk about at, at a different time. But the way in which I would summarize it globally is that the trend is moving away from the customer and towards the, towards the bank. Now, there's also a, a second caveat to that as well. And Mahesh has mentioned this a couple of times that the compromise in a scam is not on the sending side. And it's usually the sending bank that have to wear that cost for the fraud. It's the victim making transaction in their account. However, the fraudster has to convince the victim to send the money to an account that they can control. Because as a scammer, if I can't control the beneficiary account at the receiving bank, I can't get that money out. So there's little value to me as a scammer in, in doing that. And regulators are starting to recognize this as well. So they recognize that the compromise is occurring on the receiving side. And as Mahesh said, that creates a mule problem and an AML problem on that receiving side. So in a, in a world first in the UK, and it would be very interesting to see if this is adopted in broader parts of the world as well. From next year, scam losses will be split 50-50 between the sending bank and the receiving bank. So this is going to create an end-to-end -end view of the transaction consortium data that he's mentioned is going to be very critical in doing that. Banks will have to think about transactions coming into their institution, as well as transactions leaving their institution, which is typically the way in which we think about fraud detection today. So this is really going to change the paradigm and move the needle, not only in terms of the, the level of protection that victims and consumers get, but how banks have to respond from a technological, technological rather, a process um, and a collaboration perspective as well. Um, so that would be my attempt to summarize a very complex topic in yeah. just a couple of minutes. <laughs> so I think I'd, clearly this is, uh, you know, there are a lot of diverse views on this. And I think even as regulators, uh, their views are diverse across uh, regions. Uh, you know, so it, it, it really goes to show how complex this is and there's no one right answer to it. Uh, you know, it's about how, it's about, I think the first thing is, if you ask me, it's about the onus to prove. I, from, from an India perspective, the onus clearly lies on the bank that they need to establish that the customer was involved in the fraudulent transaction and therefore, uh, you know, they can dispute the transaction later and say that, you know, this is the reason that, uh, you know, we want the customer to pay back the money. But I think that comes much later. There's a clear requirement that there is a fraud complaint, you get the refund and then you start looking at that. So I think somewhere it is also how uh, important it is for banks to really look at it uh, closely. Uh, and then establish, you know, what really went into the transaction, what who who was really involved, and is the customer knowingly uh, giving out the information or unknowingly doing that? It's too complex to really prove at, at a particular point of time. Therefore, uh, you know, we leave at that, uh, Dan. And I, I, I really, I, I, I definitely believe this is not, uh, you know, something that can be concluded in this kind of a uh, talk. But yeah, it's important to get the diverse views and then understand why those views exist at the first place. Uh, uh, before I move to the next theme, Mahesh, just, I'm just uh, uh, thinking we can take one question which is relevant to what we were discussing is on the awareness part. Uh, there's a question from the audience that while there is a text message, you know, which banks generally send to, to customers on, you know, what could be potential fraud, there are pin related, uh, you know, messages that go through. What are the other ways that, you know, uh, where banks are really looking at public awareness on these things? Are there any other innovative ways that banks are really looking at apart from uh, text messaging and uh, campaigns? So I think it's a very interesting question. Thanks for this audience who's asked this question. See, one is looking at a bank level. One, apart from these text messages and everything, there's a WhatsApp messages, your mobile is controlled. See, the other important point is uh, big control, which banks are now imp implementing is SIM binding which will help you to address the issues of the fraud because if the mobile is binded by the SIM and then the transaction is happening from that SIM, then it is a huge amount of protection. But I want to slightly elaborate this conversation at, to the industry level where the funds are moved out. But that again, there's a golden hour. The golden hour is 
say one hour or 30 minutes where you have to just immediately report to that person that that number and from there on at an india level there's a connectivity across all the banks in the country where the message is flashed to the respective banks and the respective banks of the fund is moved on to the account they have immediately put a freeze or hold to the extent of the money which has been disputed here so in a way that's really um, whether the customer should not be worried about saying was do i know this contact number of my bank and if i'm working if I'm having three three bank accounts will i remember all these bank accounts that was a huge problem which was faced by many customers so the government stepped in and said boss i'm giving you a universal number please liaise with this just call this universal number and immediately from that number onwards you can with the bank the the portal just works out an online refresh and all the banks are supposed to work 24 bar 7 I have a dedicated team of 24 bar 7 to handle these kind of alerts coming in from i4c so that is kind of helped uh, to a larger extent uh, to address the genuine uh, so called disputes which are there by the customer but that still doesn't address the point of daniels and which you mentioned earlier with with the customer himself is a party to the whole thing uh, and is gullible uh, to the fraudster and by having this so called stockholder syndrome where they call they just get friendly with the customer and they keep asking questions being very and just give him some 100 rupees 200 rupees as a gain and then finally take out a huge amount of money i was just uh, give i mean one simple example a senior citizen in my society was told that i am sending an otp for, uh, for and i am transferring you money as a rent and this guy uh, portrayed himself to be an upper army person and when that guy gave the OTP, he actually got the money into his hand, actually. So I think the I think that's a point which I earlier mentioned. The segmented campaigns will really help. Uh, today, you're doing an outbound call for a sale of a personal loan of 5 lakhs. Why don't we do an outbound call proactively to these set of customers who you feel are gullible? And that can be clearly ascertained by a trend of saying, was taking the existing disputes and do a by dissecting of which segment, which age, I mean, little bit of that, which we do in terms of portfolio analytics should also be done at fraud analytics end so that we can have a targeted campaign for these set of customers. So that's very useful, Mahesh. Thanks for sharing. I'm sure a lot of us uh, were not aware that, you know, these are some things that can be used, uh, you know, in the golden hour. I think that really makes a lot of sense to really proactively report. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, let me quickly move to our next theme, uh, which, you know, we were discussing about the impact in the previous theme. and. Obviously, uh, the question then moves into how are we really combating this risk of, of fraud and financial crime as such? Uh, clearly, we also understand the way we've discussed different dimensions of these kind of frauds. Uh, it also means that the methods to really combat fraud uh, when it comes to from a digital side also means implementing some proactive and multifaceted approach as such. One of it is clearly awareness, and we discussed that you know at length. Uh, it's not just about monitoring, but also coupled with awareness. I think that's what we uh, we are talking. But uh, it's I think one we did touch upon. You know, Mahesh, you spoke about twenty four by seven monitoring. You spoke about how you know the onus comes back to the bank. How regulatory expectations are that clearly means that technology will play a huge role and is playing a huge role when it comes to monitoring digital frauds. I think the way the transaction volumes are sheer volumes. Uh, the way uh, cross uh, you know customer transactions are happening at a quickest point of time it 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 is i think imperative that we have the best of technologies to really monitor these kind of situations as such uh, so mahesh again coming to you we know this is complex we know you know the way the transactions are happening is definitely complex how do you look at methods uh, which you as a banker are adopting to prevent some some of these fraud situations what are you really looking at? What is if you can share some of your experience on this uh, with the audience? That would be really great. See, well, I mean, this is I would say it's a it's not a there is no easy bullet or silver bullet to solve this issue, but it's a combination of five six items which you say. For example, as a bank, when you reach a threshold of volume of your business, you need to have advanced fraud detection systems, which work on a neural network model and sometimes even using artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, to handle sophisticated kind of fraud transactions as well and more importantly the enhanced authentication mechanism see today in the country all the transactions which is emanating within india is a two factor authentication so basically it means that there's an authentication layer and an authorization layer most of the banks in the country who are in the who are private banks have this authentication monitoring and authorization monitoring but some of the banks which are very weak in controls will have only the authorization monitoring. So 
I think the fundamental point is now the monitoring has to shift from authentication from from authorization, because earlier there were trends. Uh, earlier we were only doing authorization monitoring, but now that e-commerce is growing today, if you see rough and ready in any credit card business, the number of, amount of spend which is happening through. e-commerce is more than 60% which was it either to some 30 40% some 3 4 years back and post covid as you rightly said this trend has really gone up so it's very important that transactions are being monitored at an authentication level as well and uh, as i rightly mentioned uh, we have to profile these customers uh, depending upon the risk segments and depending upon the way they are getting targeted and the relevant targeted campaigns uh, uh, which either to was only a marketing job should also be a risk job to make it more fruitful from a customer engagement perspective actually and the last thing is about the collaborative information sharing which i just now mentioned some time i don't want to repeat for the sake of time the uh, the information sharing within the industry and uh, the data sharing about the industry is something which is very very important and the and the and is also about see fundamentally and it's also it's, it's all about when you launch a product in the bank you have to be very clear as to say what is the inherent risk and what are the control factors and then what is the residual risk yeah. so this is something which is very very important from a fraud risk function and they have to play a very pivotal role yeah. in any product launch which is happening in the bank and look at from a customer perspective from a geography perspective and and the product perspective to come out with a clear control factors and therefore launch the product and any fraud mechanism will have a prevention preventive mechanism and also a detection mechanism so the preventive is kind of addressed through your mechanism where you also a part of that product approval committee where fraud input fraud risk inputs have been sought before even launching a product from and looking at from an entire perspective the other important item is also about the prevent uh, the monitoring mechanism so i discussed about the monitoring mechanism also right. it's all about employee training within your own organization how are you communicating this to your own employees and these employees in your organization are technically the amb- ambassadors at the branches so and how are you ensuring your all your touch points carry that messaging be it at a branch in a window how is it carrying that message what is the kind of messaging which you are giving to the customer and I, and the, this goes back to your previous point vikram the bank which is seen which is perceptibly seen focusing on uh customer education to uh, to reduce uh, incidences of fraud the customer confidence in this bank is very very high and i think it's it's it, it is very important that the bank is seen to ensure that they are engaging with the customer on the security issues time and again so that it gives a lot of confidence to the customer saying okay this is my bank it's going to take care of me so i think it's a combination of advanced fraud detection enhanced authentication mechanism Uh, real time transaction monitoring data analytics and also co- information collaboration among the industry and also customer education and awareness is something a combination of five to six prong approach and more importantly when you launch a product what kind yeah. of controls you have so i think it goes from those basic things which will help to address this whole issue is my limited uh, point of view from my experience in the last uh, so called 30 years in this domain actually no absolutely mahesh i think again very very relevant uh, points you mentioned Uh, you can't just look at uh, combating uh, methods. You know, just looking at monitoring as one of them, right? You have to look at a combination, like you rightly said. Uh, and you know, even if you ask me personally as a fraud practitioner, when we look at investigating some of these frauds, we we really see where the root causes are there. You know, so monitoring has happened, but can you really make it more preventive by you know, like you rightly mentioned, when the new product itself, when you, when you're launching a new digital product. are you involving the fraud management function at that stage itself to see what are the vulnerabilities can something really come out of it and how can you really counter it at that stage itself rather than coming it uh, you know taking it again later from a perspective of monitoring so i completely agree there's a it's a multifaceted approach it's not just about looking at monitoring or looking at one uh, versus the other i think it's about a combination of factors so thanks for for that uh, dan i'll come to you because this is very very critical when we when we speak about technology uh you did touch upon initially uh, you know uh, from a perspective of how uh, technology is playing a key role and i think the 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 way banks are moving from a digital perspective i think that's only going to increase if, you know we are really going to see a mass increase in the way uh, the digital channels are going to be uh, considered for different products let's look at what are the new age technologies and what are the new age tools available from a fraud perspective and i will also combine a couple of questions from the audience because 
I think we all know about AI, ML. You know, we keep talking about it. Uh, sometimes these are very loosely used as well. But I think clearly in the in the if if you took at look at fraud as a use case, we believe that AI and ML really uh, plays a key role. So, what is your view on on that? You know, what are the new age tools that are available today? Uh, which organizations can use uh, from a market standpoint? How would AI and ML really look? Uh, you know, be considered as use cases when it comes to fraud? And maybe I'll add another point because you touched upon behavioral biometric. Uh, you know, that is something which uh, banks are talking about uh, in the last six months. I'm hearing a lot. You know, when I look at uh, when I speak to uh, my clients from a banking perspective, I hear that. Uh, so one other question has which has come from the audience is: Is that really being used on the ground? And what is the you know benefit of really uh, using that kind of methodology? So multiple things, Dan. But you know, it'll be good to share. Get your uh, share of perspective. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I think behavioral biometrics is a is a good place to start. And I think um, using behavioral biometrics actually weaves really nicely into the the other part of the question, which is how does AI and, and machine learning help help generally? So you know, behavioral biometrics for those um, that are unaware is the concept of understanding how a human interacts with, with their device, whether that be mobile or whether that be uh, fixed in terms of, of laptop and, and desktop. Um, it's a little bit different from the traditional biometrics that we think about, which might often be um, a fingerprint or a touch ID or a facial recognition and a, and a face ID, um, in that it's a little bit more dynamic because it's thinking about how does that user interact with their, with their device from a perspective of how do they move their mouse? What's the speed of the mouse? Um, What's the distance that they usually cover with the mouse on the screen? How often do they usually click when they're logging into their, their internet banking? What does their um, keystroke patterns look like? Do they have a tendency to use keyboard shortcuts? How long do they hold the key down for? What's their speed of typing? On a mobile, how hard do they press the screen? What's the size of the touch? At what angle do they hold their device? So there's thousands of different data points that can be collected in real time as somebody's interacting with, with their device. Um, and that allows us to start to understand over a period of about five to eight interactions or five to eight sessions, you can get a baseline of how that user usually interacts with their device. What that then allows you to do is say, well, when they come back in session six, how does the behavior that they're exerting now compare to that baseline? And traditionally, what that's allowed is the bank to get a really good understanding of is this the regular user coming in to use the account? So it's been very effective uh, um, at thwarting some of those unauthorized fraud attacks because if it isn't the genuine customer coming in, it becomes very easy to, to understand and, and underpin that. Now, what um, providers of behavioral biometrics have started to think about more recently is a slightly different spin on that question. So the question is no longer, is it the customer? The question is, what's the intent of the customer? And that's the difference between the unauthorized fraud and the authorized fraud. So it might be the customer going in, but are there any subtleties and any um, characteristics within that behavioral set of data that allow you to understand if the customer's making a regular transaction or can we differentiate that they're actually being scammed? And some of the things that we start to think about at a feature level, and this is really getting into that, that machine learning layer now, is what, um, what transparencies and intricacies do we have within that data to help us understand that? And how do we then weave them together at scale to be able to uncover and create a, a risk propensity. So things like when we look at scam sessions, they tend to be longer than a regular session. So usually somebody logs in, they uh, go in with a clear intention, they make a transaction that might be two minutes end to end. When somebody's been scammed, we've spoke a lot so far about how it's vital for the scammer to be able to build trust with the victim. Now that can't be done in two minutes, right? That needs a significantly um, significant amount of time. Sometimes the customer can be logged into their accounts for 15, 20 minutes before they make that transaction. So the length of, of, of session is a big one. Um, things like understanding how they input the beneficiary account. So if I owe you money, Vikram, you might send me your account details. I might paste it in. I might remember the first four digits of the account number, put them in, stop, get the second four, put them in. If somebody's reading a beneficiary account or a mule account to me down the phone saying, send your money here because it's a job scam or an investment scam or some of these things that were mentioned earlier, the pattern's very different because they'll read a digit, it'll be entered. They'll read another digit, it'll be entered. So there are subtleties in terms of how that data is entered that can then be analyzed through machine learning to say that actually what we're seeing here stacks up relative to what we've seen happen in, in other scams when we look at the data across the bank. So we think about it in two levels. Is this different for the user? 
And is this consistent with numb bad scam data um, that we've seen in the past? So when it becomes a question of how does machine learning work, uh, machine learning is fantastic for highlighting those differences and those anomalies. But one of the things that you have to be considerate of with machine learning is that the machine learning model needs a significant amount of what we call training data to be able to be effective going forward. So you need to have um, a good, clear, labeled set of data, not just saying this is fraud or this isn't fraud, going a layer beyond that and saying this is fraud and here's the particular type of fraud. So I think Mahesh had mentioned some of the process changes that have to be implemented to be effective. And I would cast pro uh, process as one of the kind of six or seven prongs that he mentioned, that you have to have the right labeling process in place from an operational perspective and analytics perspective to then enable the use of some of those tools like machine learning, like behavioral biometrics and like AI that we that we just discussed. So hopefully that gives an idea around behavioral biometrics and how it's being used to solve both of those fraud typologies that we've focused on so far. No, absolutely very relevant. Uh, and I think the point here is how importantly we need to change the way the monitoring is really happening because I think uh, Mahesh did mention that traditionally it's about the two-factor authentication. You know, we have an OTP-based activity, but you know, even coming from the audience, uh, OTP. You know, if I really look at my personal experience as a consumer today, when I have an e-commerce activity that is coming in, you know, an Amazon or a, you know, any kind of a food delivery app, OTPs are supposed to be given if I really want that you know product to come into my place, and that's how easy it is for me to give the OTP out. And without the OTP, I can't do that. But however, when it comes to banking transaction, I cannot share the OTP with anybody. So the same consumer needs to react differently in two different transactions. So in a day, I have three uh, transactions on e-commerce where I have to give out the OTP to get the product. In banking transactions, I just don't have to do that to really get the transaction through. So it's it's a, it's a different uh, way of looking at it from that perspective. And therefore, it's complex from a, from a consumer perspective. There's also a question that has come in from the audience or you know more a comment that, there are apps like Truecaller and WhatsApp, and they are allowed to deliver banking transaction messages to to customers. Do you think that should really continue, or do you think that should be discouraged because maybe that also is a source for, uh, you know, a fraud who could really take place out of that? What's your view on that, uh, Dan? Quickly, and maybe we can move on. Fast. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. I'll try and be quick. So I, I think, look, the, the the telecoms guys of this world will say that. SMS was never designed to be an authentication mechanism for a bank. That's always kind of been their, their position. Banks have adopted it and started to use it. And of course, it has vulnerabilities, some of which you, you've mentioned. I think what we have to do to think about this in the right way is to step out of just pointing the finger at the bank all the time. So the bank tends to get a hard time when it comes to why didn't you stop this fraud? Why didn't you stop this scam? But actually, a whole amount of, of actually, you know, 80, 90 percent of, of digital scams originate outside of the bank before the victim logs in to make the transaction. How does that engagement happen? Social media, WhatsApp, yeah. SMS. So I think there needs to be a broader discussion around what do these other components of that kill chain do to not just take responsibility, but take accountability as well. Um, you know, there's conversations happening all over the world around should Instagram be doing more to take down pages where it's clear that they're trying to recruit mules? Should yeah. WhatsApp be doing more to recognize that if one message is being sent to hundreds of thousands of customers and it contains a suspicious link and it contains wording conducive of scam, should they be blocking that at, at source? And then the, the extension of that is how can banks and, and the social media and big tech guys consider working together in future through perhaps even exchange of data to give everybody the best chance to succeed? So I think there's definitely a discussion to be, to be had there. I think we're a little bit away from the big tech guys taking any financial accountability in terms of supplementing some of the loss. But I think certainly taking the right steps to block some of this at source would be um, absolutely the right thing to do from the consumer's perspective. Well, absolutely. That's the most relevant point you made, uh, uh, Dan, because it's then it's about collaboration. And I think Mahesh also touched upon that. Uh, you know, at first stage, it's collaboration between the players in the same industry, like all banks and payment companies that can come together. And then at this next stage, how do you really collaborate with telecom, social media apps to really, uh, you know, understand and and really uh, look at the patterns and then take action accordingly, you know, and how can you really do that in a more collaborative manner? So thanks for that. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time, uh, Mahesh, one last closing remark, uh, you were part of, a, you know, heading the fraud function of a, of a very, uh, uh, you know, fastly growing bank. What's your view, uh, you know, just as a closing remark on how a fraud function really needs to get developed from an organization perspective. You did touch upon a topic that, you know, preventive uh, side of how a fraud function needs to get involved in, in a new product launch. But uh, 
Uh, what's your you know concluding remark on being heading a fraud function? Generally, it's been looked at as a cost, uh, you know, it's a cost idea or a cost function from that perspective. But how can a fraud activity or a fraud monitoring activity be looked at looked at from a perspective of driving growth for a bank as such? What's your closing remark on that? So I think uh, it's a very important question. See, when you talk about the fraud risk function, it plays a very important role to the extent of even solving a credit issue. Today, at the lending space, if you see, there's a lot of work which is happening on the fraud risk space, which is helping you to uh, uh, stop at the gate, we call it, in fraud risk function. So stop at the gate in terms of doing all the screening, sampling, and to evolving APAs and all, and stop these bad applications coming into the system, which otherwise would have passed through the system and we would have had a credit losses on that. So one way clearly is a fraud risk function can help to mitigate the credit losses as well, which will be silent in terms of credit runaways. The second important factor is that by enhancing the efficiency of your fraud risk function, you build a lot of amount of confidence in the sense of customers, which indirectly would translate into a business opportunity for the bank. So I will give you some examples where we use fraud risk as a tool to generate business. So for example, uh, you have a situation where there are suspicious transactions coming into the customer's account. You call the customer and he's saying, boss, okay, I did the transaction. Thanks for the call. It's a moment of delight for the customer point of view. For me, it's a good customer interaction. I don't want to leave it waste. So I convert that transaction into an EMI. So, and, and that transaction is the, 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 the spend of 20,000 or 30,000 gets converted into an EMI at a 14 to 15% interest. So that way, I think some of the banks which have have worked on and have ensured that uh, this doesn't, while the fraud interests are not compromised, but at the same time, you also start generating business for the bank. And these are good customers and, and, and you, they're very happy and it's a moment of truth for them. And you try this to convert into an opportunity. It is, a, it is good for the win-win situation for the bank and you actually make the fraud risk function cost neutral. Absolutely. The third incident is about your customer education. As I rightly said, customer education is going to be the key. Yeah. Keep on saying to bombarding with customer and telling them, this is what you're doing is not correct. What, what you're attempting to do this phishing transaction is not correct. Segmented approach in terms of treating the customers is something which is very, very important there. And also the last point which I want to see is, boss, we have a lot of collaboration which we need to do with fintechs. There are a good amount of fintechs which come up with very good solutions and very yeah. nimble solutions. So that is something which we need, which we as a bank should be able to collaborate with these uh, fintechs to come up with some out of the box thinking solutions to help the cost of the fraud, which will in Intel enable the bank to save cost at a long term basis. Absolutely. So I think this is the by far the three, four items, uh, which I would say from a fraud risk function. And lastly, one person has asked a question saying, what is the authentication be mechanism beyond OTP? I think there are many silent authentication mechanisms. Today, you are moving into 3DS 2.0 on the e-commerce space, and it has got a set of 40 variables which you can track at the back end and then decide whether you want to approve a transaction or decline a transaction. So silent authentication in terms of IP, geolocation, device ID, these are the other things which, which are very, very important from a bank's perspective to see and then enhance your uh, authentication mechanism as well. And, and also challenge mechanism to the customers as well. So I think that's something which we can do a silent authentication at the back end without even sending a customer an OTP. I think that's a, that's a vision of the 3DS 2.0, at least for transactions which are less than 2000 actually. The very fact that 3DS 2.0 is coming is to enable the low value transactions to go seamless even without an OTP. That's a long term perspective, but that's the objective where 3DS 2.0 had come into the industry. So sure. I think that's another important point which I think we should keep in mind when we're talking about our measures beyond what you be in terms of authentication. Right. So no, thanks, the, Mahesh. Thanks for uh, sharing your inputs. I think very important uh, points you made laid down. Dan, just uh, maybe a couple of minutes to conclude from your side. Uh, you know, if you're talking about tr customer trust, you know, how do we build that confidence back? And if you're really, and you know, the point Mahesh just discussed, you know, if fraud functions can definitely be used from a perspective of creating that trust back. If you really have the right set of monitoring, if you're really having the right set of awareness for the customer that creates that confidence. What's your concluding remark on that on, you know, how can we really look at improving or enhancing customer confidence within an organization with the use of best technology? Yeah. So as, as I said earlier, Bikram, trust can take a significant number of years to build uh, between bank and, and customer, but it can be gone in, in a moment. And 
actually fraud is one of the key pivot points in terms of whether that trust is retained and expanded or whether it's lost. And, and actually, when we look at data and, and research around this, it's not necessarily just the fact that a fraud has occurred. It's how the bank then goes on to resolve and reconcile uh, that fraud claim that the customer makes. Um, so I think customers are savvy enough in certain parts of the world to recognize that fraud can happen to anybody. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. It could happen to you know anybody on, on this call. But I think it's about how you then respond to that. And customer experience is a, is a huge part of it. So from from my own personal perspective, I, regardless of whether you've waited 20 minutes in a line, um, you know, whether you've uh, had to make a complaint because there was a charge on your account, I don't think there's any worse customer experience than logging into your accounts to see that all your money is gone. I don't see how it gets worse than that from a, from a customer experience perspective from the, from the end user's point of view. So I think I always think about this in kind of three ways. The banks failed to stop the fraud, but they resolved it quickly. So they gave them a refund. The money was back in the account quickly. That's not a bad outcome. OK, yeah. the fraud happened and they didn't stop it, but they reconciled it quickly. Customer retains the trust. They have right. advice on what to what they can do going forward. Um, if the fraud is lost, so they miss the fraud, but then they don't resolve it quickly and it, they either don't get their money back or it takes them a week to get their money back. That's a horrible experience. And that can yeah. be a real pivot point. I think all the customer cares about when they've been a victim is getting their money back. And until yeah. they get their money back, they haven't got the opportunity to think and, and reflect. If you take the final one, I'm conscious of the, the time, but the final one would be if the fraud happens and the bank stops it proactively, gets in touch with the customer and says, Mr. Customer, somebody just tried to take money from your account, but don't worry, we've stopped it. A new card is on its way or we've reset your internet banking password for you. That's the best possible experience somebody can have because they recognize that the bank has got their arm around them. And what that does is it strengthens the relationship. And then going back to the revenue point, if that customer is looking for a loan, a mortgage, some form of revenue opportunity for the bank going forward, they're more likely to come back to you rather than going to the bank over the road if they've had that bad fraud experience. So I think fraud can absolutely be an enabler for revenue in future. No, absolutely. And that's something, you know, which is very different when we, when you talk about fraud and fraud monitoring. So clearly it's about, you know, prevention. If you And if the bank can do that, that clearly enhances the customer experience. And if that's not possible, then how early you can detect it. And obviously you need the, you know, the kind of technologies to really support you there. So thanks so much, Dan. And thanks so much, Mahesh, for that. I think uh, we clearly understand that if we are able to build that customer trust, uh, it can be, uh, in, you know, a, a moving factor for the organization from a success and growth standpoint. With that, I would leave uh, the audience, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions that are continuously coming in. We've tried to pick up a few, but, you know, we'll look at it maybe try to respond to them offline, but uh, Shatakchi, over to you uh, as we've just crossed our timeline. So I thought maybe we'll just go back on that. Right. Thank you so much. All right. And with that, we have reached um, the end of the session. And what an enlightening one, I must say. You know, we started with Mr. Daniel reminding us that fraud can happen to anyone. And that is something that we've been seeing as well. You know, Mr. Vikram so wonderfully segregated this extremely enormous topic into four areas for, you know, focus uh, for us. We heard about so many insightful thoughts. We heard about customer awareness and education, uh, you know, by Mr. Mahesh. We heard about end-to-end -end, uh, transaction view by Mr. Daniel. We heard about Mr. We heard by Mr. Apologies. We heard about the complexity of, you know, who takes the onus of this issue by Mr. Vikram. So clearly, I could go on and on, you know, highlighting moments that we can take away from this webinar. But in the interest of time, I will wrap it up by expressing our deep gratitude to all our speakers present here, Mr. Daniel Holmes, Mr. Mahesh Raja Raman and Mr. Vikram Babur for their expertise and their valuable contribution throughout this webinar. Thank you so much. Your insights have truly enriched our understanding of this critical topic. I also extend my appreciation to the online attendees who have so actively participated and engaged with us during the session. Your presence and thoughtful questions have really made this webinar a success. As Mr. Vikram said, you know, maybe we can pick up the questions offline and you know, have conversations around them. Uh, lastly, of course, I would like to thank Feeds AI for their support in making this webinar possible. Their commitment to enhancing financial security and trust is truly commendable, and we are so grateful for their partnership. So going forward, if you wish to organize a webinar with us or just to say hi, please write to us at info at indiafintech.com. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.